Welcome, Wargamers, to the Ninefold Paths of the Mortal Realms, because today we are talking about the Guild of Summoners. Kinda sorta requested by Nerdy Claire in a comment. Are we getting the rest of Zinch videos soon? Well, I kind of switched into doing this new sub-faction format because there's so many things that I wanted to talk about, so many of these small stories, but I just, there's so much to cover, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. So, I've been doing this format a lot, I thought we would give Nerdy Clara a shout out to a Zinch sub-faction, and I am excited to get into it because this is quite possibly my favorite of the sub-factions from a lore perspective. There's others gameplay-wise that I'm a bit more into, but the Guild of Summoners to me highlights what a Zinch army not should be, because that's obviously very subjective, but when you read a lot of the, the various stories from, I guess, 40k and from Age of Sigmar, it just seems very zinchy. Like, it almost seems like they should be the poster boys, in my opinion. But we'll get into that. So today we're going to talk about the Guild of Summoners, starting with what a zinch cult is like, going into what makes the Guild of Summoners so unique, and they do have a very unique backstory, full of all kinds of double-crossing and different motivations and slander and guilt and all these deals. And then ask the question, finally, why is this so cool? We also have an exemplary battle to talk about where the Guild of Summoners is featured. And we'll get to all of that right after a quick message. If you are looking to start a new Age of Sigmar army or hobby project, please consider using my link to Not Just Gaming. They have huge discounts on all GW products, in addition to a huge range of hobby supplies from companies like AK Interactive, Turbo Dork, Gamergrass, Green Stuff World, Army Painter, all of it. So if there's any hobby projects or basing you need done, please consider using that link as every single time you do, it goes directly to supporting me, my wife, our cats, the channel, everything, and I could not do it without you guys. Thank you to everyone who has used it so far. Now, for those of you who are new to Age of Sigmar, as I see many of you in my comments section saying you're new and, and, and wanting information, who are the Zinch Arcanites? This is the mortal end, I should say sort of mortal, we'll get to that, of the Zinch faction. The god of change and magic and manipulation. Plots and schemes abound. Everything from your dreams to the little voice in your head telling you, hey, we could steal this and get away with it. Certainly one of the most chaotic looking of the Chaos Gods because they're all about change. So a lot of what you see isn't actually there or it doesn't actually appear as you see it. It's all illusions. It's all false and it's ever changing. Now this could look like a lot of things in practice when it comes to a uh, Zinch army, which I've done a full lore series on with a uh, link in the description down below for you. But in short... Zinch's plans often involve bringing large rituals, summoning rituals, or corrupting magic rituals into the mortal realms to basically bring the mortal realms into his little pocket of chaos. To do this, he often uses a lot of magic because magic uh, facilitates change in a very aggressive way. Mortals are often tempted by you know forbidden secrets or powerful magic that they want to be able to control to use against their enemies or feel secure. Maybe you go down a bad path, but for the right reasons, and in the end, you become corrupted. And this goes for everything, not just wizards, but also heads of state who are scheming and plotting on a political battlefield rather than a magical one. Oftentimes in Cities of Sigmar, a cult of Zinch will meet in secret, their masks don because nobody wants anyone to know who they are. These little secret societies will meet up, do their arcane rituals, pray Zinch, beseech him for power, and then slowly proselytize, meaning the cult grows and grows in numbers. And on a given day, whatever plans they have set in motion, it could be uh, opening a riftway to hell itself within the city, or it could be lowering the gates when a second Zinch army appears outside. But at some point, this cult will rise and fight back against the city, sort of like a cancer from within that nobody saw coming, unleashing all kinds of powerful magics and attacks from all different directions going on. So that's like a good basic, I think, of a, a Zinch cult in general. Some are standing armies, some are more insidious, like the ones we're going to talk about today. And so let's do that. Let's move into the Guild of Summoners with an exemplary battle from their newest battle tome called The Rise of the Summoners. The onslaught of chaos gathers momentum. Though throughout the God King's faltering empire, there are bastions of civilization that continue to stubbornly defy the inevitable. Beneath these brave city-states, circles of conjuration gather in secret to plot anarchy and insurrection. 
the most widespread of these demonologists call themselves the Guild of Summoners. Through gruesome ritual and the chanting of forbidden incantations, they tear open rifts in reality through which the malevolent entities of chaos pour. Scores of cities fall at the hands of the summoners, unable to fend off an assault from within as well as without. The Shining Citadelum of Aeda is home to an order of arcane warriors known as the Anointed Few who have achieved mastery of both blade and spell. The city manages to survive for eight days and nights against an endless tide of demons. On the ninth day, the guild enacts its most malevolent summonation. No less than seven lords of change force their way through a yawning portal, screeching in delight as they look upon the flaming ruins of the citadelum. The surviving warriors of the anointed few charge at this new threat, only to be met with a hurricane of change magic that rips through their ranks transforming them into bubbling pools of silver or living, screaming torches. With the last guardians of the Shining Citadelum annihilated, the Guild of Summoners and their masters are free to sack the city's arcane vaults, seizing many powerful relics and tomes of eldritch lore that will aid them in their next plot. Now that story hits, or at least highlights, a few of the notes that we're going to chat about today. One, they are obviously, they're called the Guild of Summoners, right? Summoning is their jam. There are a lot of different kinds of magic when it comes to Zinch, and theirs is specifically opening rifts between us and the Zinchian realm and letting demons become corporeal. This story is obviously of them attacking the Shining Citadelum of Aeda, but this story applies whenever the Guild of Summoners attacks. Oftentimes it's from within a city, as mentioned here, or they could just stand outside the door, and if the rift that they open is big enough, some real heavy hitters from the realm of chaos will come through. In this case, seven lords of change. Which, I mean, you know, despite how they good are they are in the battlefield, when they are described in the lore, a lord of change is like Armageddon come to life. It's just this terrifying notion of this massive, massive creature towers over the average person. It's shimmering with all kinds of weird magics and illusions. It doesn't quite look real and it's like swiftly going across the battlefield flying around hurricanes of lightning coming out of it warp flames just billowing it's a crazy sight and they brought seven now seven that's a weird number that's not zinch's number why would they bring seven lords of change well this is where we're going to transition away from the exemplary battle which i mean i think is exemplary of how they go to war in terms of using summoning of course they'll attack as skirmishers or whatever but the real goal of course is to tear open portals to zinch's realm and, and let the demons come do a lot of the heavy lifting which like i said exemplary that's what it, they do but if we move over to their background lore section later in the book where it specifically talks about the guild of summoners we get a bit more information and it has to do with a couple Lords of Change. Nine of them to be exact, which is Zinch's number. Nine Lords of Change at one point really ticked off Zinch. The details are, are lost to history or maybe they're just forgotten to be honest with you. But Zinch decided to punish these nine Lords of Change and called them the Exiles. They are each put into a prison of sorts and the only time that they can come out of this prison is if they are summoned to the battlefield by mortal hands, so the Guild of Summoners can pull them out. It's not exclusive to them, but the Guild of Summoners knows that these Lord of Changes or Lords of Change are available to be summoned at pretty much any given time. Now the punishment for Zinch is that they are bound to this kind of prison until they are summoned, and the only way that they can be free of going back to that prison once the battle's over is all nine of them have to be summoned at once. Which sounds so annoying, I'm not going to lie. So like one Lord of Change is, an, is, is exceptionally hard to summon because it requires an immense amount of power to bring something so big through the rift into reality. So yes, they got seven of them. They were too shy of unleashing the full, you know, exiled army of Lords of Change upon reality. Now, I love this as a punishment for Zinch demons. We'll talk about in, in why is this cool. But here's here's an interesting thing is one thing that is very clearly conveyed is that the average cultist has no concept of what they're actually doing. Like that backstory I gave you about the Lords of Change, the average person does not know about that within the cult. Because 
in their minds, when they open their rifts and summon demons, they control them. At least, that's their power fantasy going on in their brains. The truth is, they open the rift, the demon comes out, sees something that looks faintly Zinchi, and then looks over and sees the enemy, which is not Zinchi at all, and goes and kills that thing. So it's not like they have control, they're kind of just pointing it at an enemy. But once the battle's over, those demons either dissipate, or they don't care who they kill, and they'll turn on their summoners. The point is, you are sold to the illusion of power over the demonic, but you have none. It's a lie. These Lords of Change do not care about you at all. You are a means to an end. Summoning all nine so that they can all be free from each other. No longer bound to whatever weird prison Zinch has them in. And so I want to move now into why is this cool? Because honestly, you know, the Guild of Summoners, there's not a whole lot of information. Like, there's not a lot to literally talk about. But the implications of it are far cooler. One of which is just, I like summoning factions. Uh, the Chaos armies tend to have a lot more of it than others. But to me, it connects the entire army, especially these, these God-specific ones, where you have a bunch of mortals that are seeking power and enlightenment, and they want their deity to stride into the battlefield with them. And the way to do that is to tear a hole open in reality. And when you are playing as a player with this book, you have a mortal half and a demon half. And I love that this bridges the gap. The mortals exist to summon the demons. I just, I like the direct interplay of lore and mechanics. Especially for the Guild of Summoners because they are pretty much exclusively trying to summon Lords of Change to fit their backstory. Each of these chaos books has like sub-factions that really lean towards mortals and, and some that really lean towards demons, but I love the Guild of Summoners because they, they do both. They are a mortal faction with their own cool backstory and, and reasons for doing things, but it directly ties to bringing Lords of Change directly to the table. Is it effective in-game? I don't know, I'm not a Zinch player. I just think it's cool. Now, let's go into the real meat of this is... That backstory about the Nine Lords of Change is a very interesting one, and I like the punishment that Zinch puts them in. The reason being is, one, they're in prison. That's the immediate obvious punishment. Okay, I'm going to call it prison. It's just like a little subset of his realm. They can only come out when they're summoned. The reason I find this to be a very interesting punishment, especially for Zinch, is because what it's doing is forcing these Nine Lords of Change to get really good at manipulating. Because, like I said, the average mortal doesn't know that they need to summon nine for those nine to be free. In fact, they don't know that they're caged. They think they're just opening a gate to Zinch's door and, hey, this big bird just happens to walk through. Oh, look, there's another one until you get seven. On the back end, all of these Lords of Change would be manipulating multiple cults, just kind of sending chaos influence as much as they could. They could still um, tap into demons that are beneath them, even though they're exiled. They still have influence within the mortal realms, whispering to mortals. So, nine demons of incalculable magnitude trying to manipulate multiple forces across the mortal realms to summon nine lords of change. This means that the ultimate trial to get back into Zinch's good graces is showing how manipulative and twisting of people's fates and directions you can be. Which I think is a very fitting punishment for a Lord of Change. Now, for these Lords of Change, of course, they're going to have multiple cults beneath them. Probably nine, because why? That's Zinch's number and Yagatsta. And their goal is, of course, to foster the Guild of Summoners. Right? Hey, keep summoning Lords of Change. Get really good at it. Hey, hey, I'm going to point you to a direction of arcane magic where you can really tap into this. And you can summon a whole bunch of Lords of Change under your control. Again, feeding them lies and manipulations. Because they need to make the, the guild powerful enough to summon nine lords of change, which is a big ask. But also, they don't want to make them too powerful. If you give the mortals too much power, they may try to bind said lords of change. Maybe they get smart and powerful enough to realize, you know, I shouldn't take any chances and assume that they come in under my control what if I just do a second spell to bind them to my will, right? You don't want that happening. You want them to be smart enough, but not too smart where they get clever ideas. And all that stuff is in motion towards achieving your goal of summoning nine lords of change at once. Which, I mean, can we just agree, whatever battlefield that happens to take place at is going to have a bad time. 
And in my mind, I would really love it if it happens against like the weakest possible target. Like it's easy to imagine like a, a war of that magnitude happening at like Hammer Hall, actually. But can you just imagine if it's just like a fishing village and for whatever reason, maybe they're just standing in the right, you know, waypoint markers of ley lines or whatever. All nine Lords of Change pop out to attack like a fishing village and there's just one guard like whoop. But this idea of the Lords of Change like manipulating these cults, again, to free themselves. This is how they get out of their prison. But to the cultists, it's their entire life. It's their identity. It's their religion. It's their their community, their social circle. It's all built on a lie. And that's what I love about the zine stuff, right? This, this sub-faction, even in the lore, connects mortals and demons into the ever-shifting plots and lies and machinations. There are kings and pawns in the zinch world. And so this just really highlights a lot of it. The point is, when you become a cultist, or even, you know, a magister, or some, like, whatever level you want to be on the mortal spectrum, you think that you are in control. It, Zinch is a faction of people who constantly think, I got this. I'm the one who can handle this magic. I'm the one who can discover the secrets. But the truth is, you're never in control. Because the minute you start tapping into any kind of Zinchian power, there is a demon, there is an entity, there's something above you that is pulling strings that you don't know. You can't trust anything that you got, even though, by this point, you would have seen practical applications from your magic. Like, yeah, they'll give you a fireball so that you feel powerful. They'll, they'll do stuff to give the illusion of power and control. But that's all it is. It's hollow. And I have no doubt that whenever the Guild of Summoners finally unleashes nine Lords of Change, yeah, they're going to come out and fight their enemies and then immediately punk these Guild of Summoners because they know too much about them. Their use has been satisfied and they are no longer necessary. And that to me makes them exceptionally intriguing and interesting. But I would love to hear your thoughts on the Guild of Summoners. I, I Do you actually play them in the game? I've never seen anyone purposefully try to take them onto the table like who just love lord of change models and the summoning i always see other sub factions instead of this but i don't know it's to me lore wise it's definitely one of the most compelling that's out there it's just you rarely ever see it on the table as we did give a shout out to a nerdy clara please let me know what kind of video content you would like to see in the future it's really helpful if there's something specific a character a sub faction something where i can just sit down grab a screenshot of your question and start researching the more specific, the better. Anyway, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.